You guys are in for a treat um, because we have a guest who is, has been a guest here before. You've read the book and, and um, now you get to hear the real life uh, stuff. So um, Ms. Bloom, are you going to introduce or? Okay, and Ms. Bloom is going to introduce. So I have to stand on my tippy toes because Mr. Walls is much taller. It's really something very special when the pages of the book, when the characters of, the, of a book that you've read walk off the pages into our auditorium. So I'm going to introduce you to Brian. He'll speak for a little bit, and then I know we have a lot of questions. So when, he, when we take questions, just raise your hand, and um, I'm not going to waste any time. You know who I am, but I'm going to ask Mr. Walls, Brian Walls. Good morning. Uh, thank you again to my friends at Yeshiva Flatbush for having me back. Um, I always enjoy coming here, a uh, high level of questioning. Um, I always leave with a lot of things to ponder, a lot of things to think over, so it's, it's really it's a pleasure for me to be here. For all you back row guys that got pushed down to the front, that was, that was me, so I, I feel your pain. But um, um, I have a bad habit sometimes when I'm asked a question, I, I kind of read into it and I think, okay, this is what they want to know, even if that's not what the question was. If you ask a question and I don't completely answer it, feel free to just, you know, uh, ask for clarification. So um, I really don't have anything else to add. So do we have any questions? Yes, young lady with the orange wristband. So do I see any of my parents' personalities coming out in me? Um, I, I, yes, absolutely. And I think that um, that's not um, particular to me. I think that's any time as you get older. Um, you start to, your parents have much more of an influence over you than you realize. My parents, in some ways, um, they influence me in ways that I didn't expect. Um, I, I, don't, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I think that's directly because of my father. Growing up in the culture that I grew up in, it was a rite of passage to smoke as quickly as you could. Um, drinking was a big part of the culture that I grew up in, not only within my family, but because I saw what it had done to my father, um, I purposely went the other direction. So there is that where it sort of fo forces you or, or focuses your attention in a different way um, to the point that I, I would go through a period when if I were out with friends and we were drinking, I would make sure that I left some alcohol in my, in my glass at the end. Um, because the last thing my father would do in a bar would be drain his, drain his drink. So I would take the opposite to the point that if I were leaving a bar and I had finished my drink, um, I would order another one just so I could leave it on the bar because I did not want to be my father. So there was that. Um, but conversely, there were also other things that I find myself, uh, particularly when my daughter was born, I found myself doing things and every once in a while I would stop back and say, oh my gosh, you know, that, I sounded just like my mother just now. That, that was horrible. Um, and um, yeah, and now the ironic thing is I see her doing things and I'm like, you sound just like your grandfather or you sound just like your grandmother, but it's not. She's imitating me or her mother. So yeah, I, I think your parents have much more impact on you than, than you really realize at the time, so. So the question is, how is my perspective different than my sister Jeanette's? Um, I'd go a step further. I'd bring my sister Lori into that. My sister Lori and I, we're not estranged, but we're not very close. And I think part of that is because Lori has a very, very different perspective. And she has sort of built um, her own sequence of events that in some ways does not align with my sequence of events. Um, and I think when my sister Lori and I talk, 
she'll say things and I'll say that's not what happened. Um, but in Lori's mind, it did. Um, Jeanette and I are, are much closer to being on the same page, but we will see it in very different ways. We'll see the same incident, um, and Jeanette tends to see it as, um, she'll, she'll see it from a very uh, optimistic point of view, sort of through rose-colored glasses. And what I've said in the past is, is you know, it's, it's looking at a train wreck, right? You can look at a train wreck and one person could say, oh my goodness, you know, a hundred people just got killed. And somebody else will look at it and say, oh, look, the little puppy escaped. And my sister tends to see the puppy being saved and I tend to see the hundred people. Um, neither perspective is wrong. Um, both look at events and, and put them in a certain category. Um, so it really is just how you, how you internalize it, how you deal with it. Um, but also, interestingly enough, I find my perspective, um, and going back to the original question of parents, I find my, my perspective changing in some ways. I think I'm less hard, uh, I judge my parents less harshly now than I did in the beginning, having gone through some things and saying, okay, maybe they did the best they could given who they were and, and the circumstances at the time. So, yes, sir. Um. So do you feel that your childhood was accurately depicted by your sister, and how do you have bring it differently? I would say that, um, again, and it goes back to perspective, the, the, it was accurately presented. Um, it was, in my opinion, it was a little grimmer than it was um, presented. Um, It's my sister chose not to focus on some of uh, uh, of the, the the things that were a little bit more negative, um, and admire her for that. Um, you know, it reminds me of the book Night, um, which I'm assuming everyone here has has read, right? You know, Ellie Wazell to to you know to be as optimistic, and if you ever heard him talk in real life, to to go through that. And to just, you know, to be able to still love your fellow man, I, I you know, I, I kudos to him. I mean, it just, it, it floors me. I, I don't, un I, I wish I could be that person. Um, and that's sort of, I think, more, more how my sister viewed it, um, saying, yes, this was not a great thing, but it made me who I am, and I like who I am, so you've got to take the good with the bad. Oh. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> no, uh, the question was, would I rather that the book had not been written? Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's my sister's story. Um, in, in some ways, it doesn't feel like my story because, again, getting back to perspective, it's, while it's all true, it, it's, it's her story. And I'm thrilled that she wrote it because I think it was very helpful for her to tell her story. Uh, for a long time, my sister viewed it as a as a, a source of shame, who she was. It was a dark secret, um, and she kept her past hidden. Um, so I think it was very, very helpful for her to put that out there and to sort of see that people aren't as judgmental as you think and that people can be more accepting than you think. So it's, it's there's sort of two prongs to that as far as how it relates to me. In a, in a weird way, it doesn't really feel like my story, even though I was there just because it's written from my sister's perspective. So it doesn't bother me from that perspective, and, and I think it was very beneficial to my sister Jeanette. Conversely, though, my sister Lori um, I, is not happy about the book having been written. Um, and again, I think because it challenges the narrative that, that she wants to present. So she is quite unhappy that it was written. And my mom just admitted to me for the first time the other day that she did not uh, read the book in, in its entirety. She made it about halfway through and she stopped. So, so I'm guessing she, she would say no. She would prefer that it wasn't. Yes, sir. Was it harder for you to live in Welch once your sisters moved to New York? Uh, was it harder for me to live in Welch once my sisters moved? Not really, because number one, not much time elapsed, and also because um, 
we, and again, from my sister's perspective, we were much tighter um, than, than she perceived us as being a much more cohesive unit, whereas I felt that it was sort of every man for himself. And it's almost like a wolf pack, you know. You can say, well, does a wolf pack run together because of friendship, or does a wolf pack run together because it makes them more efficient? Um, but once you've, you know, once you've got the food, then it's just you, you focus on that. So, for instance, I mean, if I got a few dollars and I would go and, and buy food at the local supermarket, I wouldn't go home with that food. I would eat it all before I went home. So I took a very um, um, isolated approach. Uh, whereas my sister, I think, saw us as much more of a, a cohesive unit. So probably means that she's a better person than I am, but yes, sir. Yeah. Which event in your childhood had the strongest impact on you as a person? Which event in my childhood had the strongest impact? That's one of those questions I'm going to go home and think about. Um, I don't know, to be quite honest with you, and I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid that. It's, it's yeah, I, I really... Yeah, I, 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 it's, they sort of strike me as a sequence of events. Um, so if you come next year, I'll probably have a pretty good answer for that because I'm going to spend the next year thinking about that. But I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer, but nothing really stands out as far as that. Yes, sir. So starting out where you were, like not really having much, and now ending up where you are now, would you agree with the fact that the American dream is attainable for anyone who tries to <clears throat> So is the American dream attainable? I mean, that's, that's one of those questions that I focus on a lot. Um, right now, I, I, I work for Habitat for Humanity, building affordable housing. And I think the, 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 the thing that's a challenge for people, and it was a challenge for me, is how do you realistically look at where someone else is at? And there's sort of this, this uh, belief that you can pull yourself up from your bootstraps. But what happens if you don't know what bootstraps are? What happens if you don't have those role models? What happens if there is no one around for you to say, that's who I want to be, because that person, as soon as they get to a point where they're able to, leaves. So if you go back to Welch, which um, continues to be in the news as one of the places that are, that's, uh, continues to be just you know, opiates or a horrible problem, um, Poverty is, is just crushing. I, I, I think that at a certain point, you can get crushed to the point that you cannot pick yourself back up. So I think I buy into that narrative of the, of the yeah, the American dream. You work hard. You can, you can get to where you need to be. But I don't think it's that easy. When I, when I came to West Virginia, I was a skinny 17-year-old Red, I, I look like a matchstick, right? Like thin, blazing red on top, thick hillbilly accent. I was probably the most unthreatening person you would ever want to meet. And people would look at me and they'd say like, oh my gosh, this, this poor hillbilly kid is going to get decimated. We need to take him under our wing. We need to help him. I can't underestimate how much that helped me to pull myself up, whereas if maybe if I had looked a little bit more threatening, for whatever reason, right, or if I had fallen into maybe a different stereotype, maybe people wouldn't have been that opening. Maybe people wouldn't have been that willing to extend themselves. So, yeah, I think the American dream still exists for some people, but I think some people are so busy just trying to figure out how to eat that they can't dream. Oh, good question, though. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel your childhood gave you certain personality traits, and would you give up those aspects of your personality for a normal childhood? So how did my childhood affect my personality? Well, it made me a pretty wonderful guy. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, it's interesting because if, if you look at my family, again, you know, very, very different, everyone in it. So, and it, it, you know, the, the old adage, what doesn't, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But I think sometimes what doesn't kill you just cripples you and makes you weaker and, and harder to survive the next attack. So it really depends on who you are. 
Um, now, I was reading, the, 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 there, you have a poster when you, when you come in, and it talks about the values of the school and what they want people to leave here with. And it's character and compassion are the first two things, right, and scholarship. I think my childhood, my parents gave me all three of those things. Um, despite my father's flaws, despite my mother's flaws, they valued character, and they valued compassion, and they valued scholarship. So it was interesting to see those so prominently displayed. And it goes back to the American dream, right? You know, once you've got your slice of the pie, what do you do with it? Do you say, okay, let me get more, more, more? Or do you say, okay, now it's time to show a little compassion, which ties into character, right? So I wouldn't, I, in hindsight, at the, if you'd asked me at the moment, I would have said my childhood sucked. Um, would I have traded it? Not now, not where I am now. But yeah, certainly at the time I would have. Hope that, did I answer it or did I just kind of ramble on? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Do you think that all these events shape you to be sort of a lone wolf or you're just naturally introverted? I think they, uh, so did the events, did the events sort of uh, make me become a sort of an island or isolated? I, I think that's, and I think they did. Um, you know, I, having a best friend and then, you know, oh, this is my best friend, we're gonna be friends for life, and then your parents come home and two hours later you've moved and you didn't get to say goodbye, um, and you're never gonna see that person again. I do think it, it's made it very easy for me to cut off relationships and to uh, put up protective walls, and that's one of the things that I wish I didn't do as much as I do, um, but probably not going to change at this point. Yes, ma'am. So did my sister writing the book make me more open about my childhood? I was always open. My sister and I, Jeanette, my sister Jeanette and I had a falling out at one point because I was angry at her because she didn't want to admit who she was. So I was much more confrontational in my approach um, in that my attitude was, um, this is who I am. If you don't like it, that's your problem. Um, so I, I don't think it made me more open. I think it, I wouldn't go around telling people, but if it, if, if it was raised, I would address it. Um, so it probably made me talk about it more, but I think I was always pretty open about who I was and where I came from. Yes, ma'am. Um, like I'm sorry, what's that? So how did what my grandmother did affect me as, as an adult? Did, how did it, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I would like to say um, that it didn't, um, but I'm sure it's affected me in ways that I'm not even aware of. Um, you know, probably that irresistible urge I have to punch old ladies in the face when I'm walking down the street is probably, I mean, I think they're totally unconnected, but um, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's one of those intangibles. Um, the interesting thing about that was I didn't, I remember the fight with my sister Lori and my grandmother, but I didn't remember it until Jeanette asked me. She said, you remember what that fight was about? And at that moment, I had a clear recollection that I did not have before. So, and I was always kind of skeptical about repressed memories. Um, you know, particularly being a former cop, it's like, yeah, whatever. But it was interesting. It was it was a, a light switch. So it's it's kind of fascinating how the the human mind is able to really compartmentalize and and wall something off. So I'm sure it's affected me more than I'm willing to admit. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you ever enjoy the adventure of Did I ever enjoy the adventure of picking up and moving to new places? Um, no. I think we we would put a positive spin on it, you know, and that was, I think, self-serving on my parents' part, you know, oh, it's a great adventure, and, and my mother will bring that up to this day. So I, while I didn't enjoy it, if, if we get back to how do things affect you, 
I, I think I sort of compromised. When I was in the police department, I would change units every two years, religiously. Um, you have to basically stay in a unit for two years before you can move on to an, the next unit. So at, sometimes at my own detriment, I would feel, um, I would be in a unit that I was very happy being in, but then it'd be like, well, two years, I've got to move on. So again, I think it's one of those ways of, of compensating without realizing it. Um, you both have a school people. Yes. The title of the book is The Glass Castle. Do you feel a connection that you've taken to maybe doing, finishing off things with your father, being in that school that you both have been in for the last few years? No, I think if anything, um, like I don't put, I put no glass in my houses. There's no windows. They're basically just big boxes with nothing but walls. Um, no, I, I think that, um, I think that my personality is, is I like to fix things and that's why I build, um, I build. I think it's more about fixing things. I don't really think because hey, my sister bought into it, but I I basically knew it was not going to happen. I did not believe my father was going to do what he said he would do. So, yes. So I heard, where am I and each of my sisters, and what? What kind of relationship? It was that. So, um, Maureen is still on the West Coast, where she went. Um, Basically, well, not basically, where she went after stabbing my mother uh, and was released from jail, um, which was one of the healthier things I think that Maureen had, had done in her life. Um, I don't recommend it, but, you know, on some level, it was sort of Maureen's way of saying, you know what, here's a toxic element in my life. I'm going to eliminate it, right? Again, I'm not advocating, you know, that, that person that keeps bothering you in class, toxic, don't stab them and throw them out the window. That's not what I want you to take away from this. But, um, but again, she was taking action to try and make things better. Um, it's very difficult for me to talk to Maureen because she is paranoid schizophrenic um, and mental health issues. I, I have, they make me very anxious. So um, when I talk to Maureen, I, I get she makes me anxious, so I avoid it. I think when Lori talks to me, I think I make Lori anxious. So um, I think Lori uh, avoids talking to me. Lori just moved to Colorado. Um, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, decided it was time to get up and go to Colorado. Bought a car, took driving lessons. Um, had three accidents, <laughs> set the car on fire on the way to Colorado, um, and someone rented her a car after that. Why you, three accidents your first week, you set a car on fire, okay. Uh, and she's in Colorado now. Uh, we have not, I have not heard from her since that happened, um, which basically it's been this last month. Uh, I've been getting it secondhand through a friend. And Jeanette and I talk Probably two or three times a week. Oh, and my mother. Uh, do we have to talk about her? Uh, she's living with my sister in Virginia. She has her own house. Um, um, con continues to be, my, my sister has a, a very large uh, farm and, and built her a house, um, which she has filled basically with stuff. Um, so I, my relationship with my mother is much, much better now. Um, I, can, I can be in the same room as her. Um, I understand who she is, but I don't know that we'll ever be as close as, as I would like to be as, as had that traditional father-mother-son uh, uh, <clears throat> relationship. But she's, she's doing well. She's hanging in there. Yes, sir. Was I satisfied with the movie and the casting? No, I think that, was, that, that like, I don't know, that, the actor that played me. <laughs> that mustache, that was a horrible mustache. <laughs> um, the, 
it's it's hard for me to really be it's hard for me to look at and say this was a good movie this was a bad movie same thing with the book right it's very very hard for me to be objective and look at it um i i thought the movie was again it 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 chose to focus on certain things um i i, I didn't i don't there was nothing in the movie that I was like, no, this is absolutely not the way it happened. Laurie was upset with the movie because some of the things that happened, um, the director took artistic license and, and made Jeanette, made them happen to Jeanette or made um, Jeanette be the one who instigated a particular course of action. Uh, so Laurie felt a little, a little cheated by that. But, but as far as from my perspective, um, yeah, I mean, other than the fact they should have gotten somebody devilishly handsome to play me, I was okay with it. Yes, ma'am. So, um, have you ever went and visited the places you used to live? And also, does your mom still sell paintings? My mother is still painting. Um, uh, as far as visiting the places that we've lived, I haven't been back probably for about 10 years. Um, the, the the only place that I would that I would go to would be um, would probably be Welch um, because I feel some connection to that. I went back to uh, the house in Phoenix and it had basically had been knocked down and uh, sort of a like a little mini strip mall had been put there, so I didn't feel a lot of connection with that. Um, but Welch is a pretty it's a pretty depressing place if you go there. The the poverty rate just continues to escalate. It's down to, I believe, about 3,000 people at this point, um, maybe fewer. There were about 12,000 when I went there um, as a child, and there were about 50,000 when my father was growing up. So it goes back to the American dream, right? How do you, you know, when, that, when your world is kind of imploding, how do you see opportunity around you when there is none? Um, you know, coal mines are, are just closing down or, or as modernization comes around, there's less and less opportunity and, and there's nothing else there. So at this point, I, I don't think there would be a whole lot of reason for me to go back to any of those places. Yes. Yep. If I could go back to one time in my childhood, one time in my childhood and do something differently? Um, hmm. Well, if you remember in the book, my father stealing money out of the pink pig, um, it wasn't just my father stealing money. I, I was stealing money out of it as well. Um, so yeah, I would probably go back and change that. And it goes back into what we were talking about, where it was, you know, everybody for themselves. Um, so that's probably the, the only thing that I'm less than proud of um and and again it's i mean there were other there were other occasions where i stole as a child i mean i would roll drunks on a regular basis um i would hang out at the local bar and i'd wait for someone to pass out and i would go through their pockets and take their money and my attitude was well they're just going to spend it on alcohol and it's perfectly acceptable for me to do so it was not um it it, it again it it, it sort of ties into everything that we've been talking about where you're able to sort of adjust your morals to fit a certain situation. Um, I, I don't, and maybe this makes me a bad person, I don't particularly feel bad about stealing money from the drunks, but I do about stealing from my sister. So um, again, I, I freely admit a moral shortcoming on my part, but um, again, sometimes you do what you feel you have to do to survive. What did my father? How would your father think of the movie? How would your father? Oh, the Woody Harrelson character? Well, the book. Oh, well, my father wasn't around when the book came out. He had, he had passed. Um, I think my father dealt with um, it, 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 it sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think my father, with his alcoholism, um, I think he was ashamed of who he was at the end. And I think seeing that 
in print or on the screen, I think would have made things worse for him. So I think he, I think he had the intelligence to know better, but I don't think he had the intestinal fortitude to change. So I, I, I'm actually glad that the book did not come out while he was alive. I think it would have been very, very, a painful process for him. Yes, sir. One thing to my father, um, I don't know. I mean, my, my father and I, it would feel very, my, my father was not demonstrative. Um, you know, I, I, I remember him hugging me exact grand total of one time when I was a child. Um, he didn't really even hug me. He, um, he put his arm around my shoulders after I got beat up in a fight that he instigated. So, <laughs> um, it would feel very strange for me to say I love you to my father. Um, so I, I think I think it would if if for my father and I it would have to be a series of conversations. I don't think there's any one particular thing that I could say that would sort of encapsulate everything. I think it would have to be, you know, I'd have to go to therapy with my dad, and and neither of us would put up with that. So did I have a fascination with fire or, um, um, this is English class, right? So an extended metaphor of the fire. Okay, all right, all right. Um, no, it, not, not an element in my life. Uh, the only thing that would probably be uh, comparable would be um, taking things apart and fixing them. So from a very early age, um, that, that was sort of my fascination. Um, first thing I would do when I got something would be look at it and say, how do I take this apart? Uh, to this day, I continue to have a fascination with broken things. Um, you know, antiques that I can fix up or furniture that I can restore, or houses that I can rebuild. So I think that would probably be, that would be my, my fascination or fixation. Yes, I think we finally, did we get to you? Okay, that's a good move with the the orange. Uh, yeah, it makes you stand out. Very clever. So, again, it it it's so. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the the question is how how do I feel about. It hasn't really affected my life in many ways. Um, if I'm on the subway, I, you know, every once in a while I'll I'll see someone read the book, and you know, part of me wants to, you know, say, "Hey, you know, what do you think of the Brian character in that?" But uh, but I don't think it's I don't think it's impacted me in many ways, to be honest with you. So in my class, we talked a little bit about homelessness that comes out in the book. Mm -hmm. and So uh, how did how does homelessness impact me? What's my perspective on it? How does it affect me? Um, if I'm riding the subway, I'll I will take whatever amount I decide to give away that day, and I'll I'll put singles in my shirt pocket. So whether it's you know eight, nine, ten dollars, um, and I, I I have them in my shirt pocket um, because I don't want to have that awkward moment where you reach in your pocket and pull out, and the only thing you pull out is a ten, and then the the homeless guy is looking at you, and you're like, I really don't want to give you a ten dollar bill. So um, it's homelessness is a. a, a I used to catch a lot of grief when, when people would hear that my mother and my father were homeless and they would say, why don't, how can you let them be homeless? And, and I would have to explain to people, I have offered to let them come live with me. My sister has offered to let them come live with us or, or live with her. 
it, it's very tricky because some people are homeless by choice and that's sort of dicey territory right when you say by choice I mean but my parents did have the wherewithal to pull themselves out of that situation but again it, it, it spoke to them for whatever reason they liked that aspect of uh, I, I, I don't know why they, they like that but um, but conversely you have you know people that I and a part of the reason I'm rambling is because it, it's a question that I struggle with. And, and I guess really what I struggle with more than anything else is I don't really feel sympathetic for homeless adults, but there are 40,000 homeless kids in the city of New York, right? 40,000. And for whatever reason, whatever makes their parents do what they are doing, it still impacts 40,000 kids. So that's really, I think, what bothers me more than anything else. Um, the bell's going to ring in a few moments. Oh, so I would like to just, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.